I now call for the report of the Assembly Trustees and I call on its convener, David Cameron. Welcome, David. David Cameron, 91. Hiya. <laughs> Moderator. I wanted to set the tone just like your granddaughter did on Saturday. <laughs> Moderator, there is recognition that the landscape of the church is changing. It is true to say that we live in anxious times. A few brush strokes paint the background. The structures that shape society show stress and fractures from top to bottom. Institutions long taken for granted are subject to renegotiation. The meanings behind social frameworks of mutual obligation governing society are hotly contested. Hallowed assumptions about the most basic loyalties and allegiances in relation to one another are subject to the most radical new questions. Innovative technologies are leading to an explosion previously unimagined. Information sources which are unsettling long established spheres of authority and undermining long-respected official sources of reliable knowledge. Reports of violence multiply around the globe, often driven by superstition and ignorance. Radicalized forces within Western culture itself pose a serious threat to internal stability. It is a time of anxiety. These words summarize the characteristics of Europe in the years leading to the Reformation. These words could also describe today, do we not need another reformation? Each year at the Christmas light switch on in Kilmarnock, where I minister, in the heart of my own parish, I watch 5,000 people disperse after the event. My congregation hosts a variety of missional events, enhancing the town program where young and old take part. Last Christmas, a wee boy on entering the building took part in our Christmas escape room experience, asked, what is this place, mummy? I think it's a church, was the reply. What did they do here? Pray, I think. More of a question than an answer. I could have wept. Whilst it's a reasonable answer, it's clear they were unsure. Why are they unsure? Because no one has modelled our Christian lifestyle nor explained it to them. They went away better informed, but they didn't return. When people no longer hear the promise of the gospel, no wonder they have no idea that the big yellow building with beautiful stained glass windows in the heart of my town is a place of worship where people are nurtured in Christian living and discipleship. Reformation is even more essential today. The report of the Assembly Trustees provides a realistic picture of where our church finds itself. This is a critical time as we make the essential changes needed to lay a sustainable foundation for the future, a re to reconfigure and reshape the church for mission and service, around fewer buildings and fewer charges, and 600 ministries due to the retirement and recruitment differential. We've reached that number already. By envisioning the renewal of the church where communities of faith join together at the heart of new and shared priorities, to lay down burdens which have been exhausting us all and concentrate not on our own survival, but on reaching a population of society indifferent to the church, overly secular, and in need of what we all have to share, the gospel of Jesus Christ, providing us with an opportunity to thrive. From personal experiences as a parish minister, I know how hard the last year has been for congregations and presbyteries. It has felt harsh and rigid, and people have not been as kind and as pastorally sensitive as they should have been. You're dealing with that hurt on a daily basis. We are grateful to the ministers, elders, church members, staff, who have been pulling together faithfully to solve the serious challenges we face and making some very difficult decisions for the future of our church. We have much to be thankful for, commend and celebrate in the work of the Radical Action Plan and the Special Commission of 2019. It is significant that what was previously seen as different agendas for ministry and mission are now recognised as an opportunity for strong collaboration in appreciation of the fact our church faces a monumental crisis in ministry and resources. This impacts all our congregations 
throughout Scotland. To complement the existing deployment of Ordain Ministry and to engage with the challenges of an increasingly secular and fragmented society, we will develop new and more diverse patterns of ministry, the focus of which must be mission and evangelism, developing new worshipping communities, planting churches, new models of church in pioneering ways for renewal to flourish, along with ministries recruitment and integrated training appropriate. The Faith Action Programme leadership team will take this forward, aligning with the priorities set out in our report. £25 million has been released from reserves under the Seeds for Growth Fund, an investment in the future. This is for presbyteries to apply to in support of new and innovative ways of being church, to plant churches in order to connect with a much broader secular sweep of society and largely disconnected communities. The Church of Scotland needs experienced ministers of the gospel as well as pioneers, church planters, both lay and ordained, and more diverse and experimental patterns of ministry. Presbyteries are encouraged to participate and benefit. Indeed, they already have been influential in shaping the criteria. The hope is that there will be a transfusion of energy into the missional dynamics of the church as a whole. A missional church whose outward face and core constitution is gradually moulded to a form that will serve the nation in the coming decades with approaches that truly resonate with society and culture. I want you to imagine the church in Scotland for the next 10 years. Imagine church where members are enthusiastic about doing things differently, dreaming bold dreams and having the energy and encouragement to experiment and learn in the process. Imagine being able to move forward in positive ways, tackling serious issues of the day, responding to the real need in Scotland. Imagine finding a creative way of getting different people with different views together to create a different future. Imagine a decade of evangelism. Ian already has. Imagine planting new church communities where they've always been needed, breaking out of our constrained systems to do so, sharing ministry for the pastoral care of the elderly in the ageing congregations whilst recognising the need to be intergenerational, fully integrating our young people, shaping the life of the church, the new alongside the old, energising and inspiring with the gospel imperative, go and make disciples. Our imaginations charged with possibilities and our hearts inspired by Jesus Christ. We all know how difficult it is to lead a church into a new place if that church has been built on the way things have I been or where the prevailing voice is, it'll never work or simply no. How do we imagine a new discipleship? fund a capacity for community amidst the disrupting changes around us and be the thriving church of a new era. You actually have the answer in your own localities. You, we, all of us have the spiritual imagination to look at things differently. All of us who are grappling with the need to change in order to be more effective in mission. All of us who are willing to move forward, shaped by a shared purpose and values crucially with a vision of what the church could be in Scotland, a visible light of hope with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a time that calls for prayer and action, for coming together with our brothers and sisters in other congregations and denominations, for cooperating to generate ideas and test them out all so that we cultivate a thriving alternative church for the future. This is now our task. We must act with unity of purpose at every level of the church. There are major roadworks in every town. They can at times be a nightmare to navigate. Temporary traffic lights and road signs provide a warning. Altered priorities ahead. When I see that sign, I know to be more observant as I change direction to find the redirected route. The road hasn't changed. Just how I should approach the way ahead, altered as a result of road utility works. For the Church of Scotland today, 
There are altered priorities out of our comfort zones, new work ahead, just how we should approach the way ahead has changed. Altering priorities as a church with our distinctive ways of doing things that seem to have stood the test of time was and is going to be difficult. Yes, of course we want to hold on to our past and what we feel is sacred, yet we are no longer able to do so. We have to sacrifice some of our established ways to make way for a vibrant church in all aspects of its life and worship and mission, one which connects across our communities and whose impact is extended. One aspect of our church is our social work arm, Crossreach. Anyone who has seen Crossreach in action knows what an influence for good it is. Yet, out there, and even within the church, people do not know that this is the church at work. We must never be shy to say who we are and whom we serve. The book of Acts is a story of tremendous risk and remarkable reward. The young church was a church characterized by daring courage, empowered by the Holy Spirit as the gospel of Jesus Christ was taken by the disciples out into the world. Over 2,000 years, the church has adapted and floundered, thrived and failed, succeeded and fallen, died and risen again and again and again. We now need to be bold to take risks, try new things. Yes, we will make some mistakes. We are human. Not every new thing will work, but for the sake of Christ and the kingdom, we must try. If we return to the age of the Reformation, we will find among reformers like John Calvin a sense of adventure. They imagined opportunities developing new forms of ministry and a spirit of innovation. It was entrepreneurial in the spread of new faith communities, the influence of which is felt to this day. The Reformation adventure in which we engage today is suffused with the presence of God. God provides us with the time, the talent, and the resources to think creatively so that we can prayerfully better understand what God is doing and what God requires of us to contribute for the good of his church in our communities. A minister was teaching young people about Pentecost Sunday. He asked them, do you boys and girls know what Pentecost is? Of course they didn't. He explained, Pentecost was when the church was gathered in one place. Suddenly there was a rush of mighty wind. Tongues of fire came down from heaven and landed on their heads. They were filled with power and spoke the gospel in all the languages of the world. And that day, 3,000 people were added to the church. Now, most of the children took that news rather calmly, but one, her eyes as big as saucers, said, that's amazing. But we must have been absent that Sunday. <laughs> the thing about that story is not that she misunderstood. The beautiful thing is she thought it could have actually happened in that church that God's spirit could come to that little congregation and give a mission to live, a word to speak, courage beyond measure, and a purpose that would transform the world. I, for one, would welcome that as a plan for our much-needed reformation. Moderator, I present the report, supplementary report, of the Assembly Trustees and move the deliverance, and I place the annual report on the table. Now, on my screen, I have two questions. So we'll move to questions for the chair. I'm going to call we've got Ian Aiken, 376, and then Justin Taylor, 492. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Um, uh, Justin Taylor, Aiken. 492. Uh, it's a comment, and uh, well, first a question and then a comment, okay. if that's okay. The, the first one is your priorities. Uh, one of the th two things that the Assembly Trustees have said before is that their priorities are Net Zero and EDI, which I claim to be a member of both. 
yet your diagrams and your pictures and say have excluded those. So I'm asking the question, are they an important part of the future or the processes that the, that the assembly trustees are working out? And the second one I wanted to comment on is, um, and I'm going to try to keep it brief, is that we've seen a, a lot of changes in society recently about women and the rights of women uh, and misogyny and sexism within women, uh, within the very structures of society. Uh, and that has been coming out in different areas. We Sorry to interrupt. We're, we're taking questions yeah. now. Is your comment a short one? Well, I, the, the, well I'll wait till a little bit then, because I'll give then it a little Then why don't we one. wait? <laughs> thank, thank you. you. We're going to stick with the questions right now, but thank you. Think Ian Aiken, you are online, I believe. Thank you, moderator. Ian Aiken, Ian, hello, 376. Ian. Um, first of all, can I thank the um, convener for, for the report and uh, indeed for all the work that uh, the Assembly trustees do. Uh, we thank God that somebody's doing that work. Um, I wanted to just uh, refer to section 5.4 of the supplementary report, where it says that um, income from united congregations may be maintained or even increase. And I wondered, in light of the fact that we have years of experience of uniting churches, what evidence is there for this? Or is, in fact, the evidence rather that income decline is more likely to accelerate after a union, indeed, uh, decline all, all round after a union? Thank you, moderator. Uh, thank you for the question and for uh, giving me notice uh, to be able to answer you more fully. The historical evidence is that income does reduce in the event of a union. 3% tends to be the guideline that we use, but this can vary in practice. However, the point being made in a report is that it doesn't have to be this way. We would encourage congregations to actively work together to keep their members. Stewardship can help by providing assistance to maintain or increase income in a union. But it also takes good leadership to keep communicating that fact that time and talent and resources is how we function as a church in every area of our work. From my own personal experience of having been involved with two unions, there was a fear that the numbers would go down and the income would also go down. But we worked very hard to maintain both. We only lost 14 members in our first union, none in the second one, and our income remained steady. It can be done. And I didn't give you an opportunity to answer the first question about the net zero. So I'll give you that now. Oh, yeah. Sorry, moderator. No, Thank that you. that's my fault. <laughs> no that's problem. okay. Um, yes, it's an integral part of, of the work. The fact that it's not on the, the, the graphic just means it is there embedded in it. So I assure the commissioner that uh, that, that work is, is ongoing in all aspects of our work. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Call on Grant Barkley and then Adam Hood. Okay. Thank you, Grant. This one, sir. This, this one goes up. <laughs> um, I'm at microphone 33, moderator, Grant Barkley, <laughs> 166. Um, my question relates to section 7 of the report. That's on presbytery funding, and I should say I'm the clerk to Glasgow Presbytery. The question is, can the convener affirm that transition funding in the current and following years shall be made available as indicated to all the presbyteries within the new presbytery structure, including Glasgow, until presbyteries become financially stable through their own income. And my reason for asking that is because while transition funding helps some presbyteries restructure, in fact, it helps all presbyteries adjust to the removal of the entire 5% of the former ministry and mission discretionary allowance. That has gone as from January this year. And in the case of Glasgow, this amounted last year to roughly £250,000. You'll see why payment of the transition funding in these next few years is essential and why I seek the assurance that I do. Chair. Thank you, and again, thank you uh, for giving notice of the question. Section 7 in the report relates to core funding, not necessarily transition funding. It's just a, a difference in, in terminology. The budget is reviewed every year, has core funding for presbyteries within it. This is currently done on the basis of around 120,000 per annum per presbytery, with the view that this will reduce over the period as they become self-sustaining. 
The funding is there to help with the initial setup and operational costs that are incurred in the early years. And as with all lines in the budget, this is continually reviewed. I'm not sure we've said, in fact, I don't believe we have said that it's fixed at £120,000 per annum for a full five-year period. What we have said is that in that period, which we anticipate that the presbyteries will require assistance, and by the end of that time, they are indeed expected to be able to support themselves financially. We have been flexible with the presbytery funding, for example, funding posts which are coming on stream before some presbyteries started up. And I understand that the Presbytery Clerk of Glasgow has been in dialogue with the Chief Officer and General Treasurer and has assured the Presbytery of that funding. And so I want to assure the General Assembly of the same. Thank you, Moderator. Thank you. Adam Hood and then Peter Johnson. Number 31. Adam Hood, number 60. And thank you very much to the convener for the report. Um, I note in the report that you're regretting the fact that the number of buildings, uh, the closures of the buildings, hasn't gone ahead quite as quickly as you'd hoped to. Um, and you want that to correspond, obviously, with the decline in ministers and the other rather depressing facts that are contained within the appendices of your report. But my question is whether the trustees, and to what extent the trustees, have considered whether reducing the number of buildings may in fact be speeding up the cycle of decline that we've been facing. I base that on the, the premise or the supposition that buildings themselves are not just spaces, but have a missional significance both in terms of being appropriate places where folk learn about the faith, but also in their symbolic role within the wider community of folks who are not at the moment involved in congregational life. So the question really is, have you considered whether the closure of buildings in itself may be part of the problem that we're facing at the moment, given that they have, a, in my view, an important mythological function. Thank you, Roderick, and thank you for that very, very important question. We love our buildings, don't we? This is not easy. It's very difficult. I think there are many, many more contributing factors to the contributing decline of the church today. It's not just about buildings at all, but our buildings are costly and we have to rationalise them. In our report, we actually say we had somewhere in the range of 4,500 to 5,000 buildings to maintain and pay for. And as a shrinking church in terms of number, this really has to be addressed. So I think we have to continue on that trajectory, but we're very conscious and pastorally sensitive to the fact that there is a lot of pain and mourning in dealing with the closure of our buildings. Thank you. Peter Johnson. And then we'll have Willie Strachan and Brian Sherritt. Uh, moderator, uh, Peter Johnson, 386. And this is a question in relation to section 7.2 of the, the main report, so on presbytery funding. And the, the second sentence there, talking about presbyteries aiming to grow their income and develop plans for financial sustainability. Um, we all know that uh, presbyteries are created equal, but some presbyteries are more equal than others. Uh, has a consideration been given to a sense of uh, egality and equality amongst presbyteries over their uh, finding sources of funding? Because we know some presbyteries have many more resources uh, within their own presbytery for creating income streams than, than others. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Another very helpful question to answer. Yes, the answer is that we, we do and we need to be flexible. Every presbytery is unique to their own demographic and geographical area. So we recognise that and we will work to be as flexible as we can be within the constraints of the budget that we present. Thank you. 
Thank you. Willie Strachan. Uh, number 53, oh, you know already. Um, 340, Willie Strachan, moderator uh, through yourself, if I might. Particularly interested in section 11.4 of the supplementary report. My apologies for not giving you notice, convener, of this in advance, where it sets out um, what is seen as a typical, i.e. median, congregation at present. And uh, my question, I suppose, is, what is the ambition for a median congregation to look like in, say, five or ten years? What is the ambition for the median congregation to look like in five or ten years? And will that contain information simply about those who turn up to worship, whether that's at 11 a.m. on a Sunday or at any other specified time during the week? Or will it include those people through organizations or within the community with whom this Church of Scotland, Christ Church in Scotland, have important contact? Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Thank you again for highlighting uh, this section of the report. I would hope it looks a lot different from this with increased numbers. Um, and I think you answered your, your own question, to be honest. Uh, there will be a lot of different ways of, of being the church in, in the future if we embark on, on this road of travel. I would be really very hopeful that it's much increased from the numbers that we've actually reported here. So thank you for the question. And I wish you well with answering your own one in, in your own locality. Thank you. Brian Sherritt, thank you. Can you tell us which microphone you're welding? Well, that well microphone, done. 41. <laughs> 41, yes, right. Uh, Dr. Sherritt retired. I was wanting to know, this 600 planned ministry posts, I take it, does not include the number of additional posts that are now being required by these huge presbyteries that you are creating. You're taking ministers out of, out of their parishes, and they're actually creating a, a bigger problem of shortage of ministers with all these. And uh, I, I was wondering if that 600 does, includes it or does not include these extra posts, because every time the church contracts, it seems to me there are that many extra additional posts outside the parish ministry that are being created. It's a very simple answer. It doesn't include those extra ministries uh, at all. It is based on ministry of word and sacrament in, a, in our communities. Thank you. And we have John Cook. And you've, I don't know whether you have two questions or whether you have registered to speak twice, but you are welcome. Thank you, moderator. Uh, John Cook, 379, microphone 53. Um, I, I was confused by the system, moderator. That's all right. I, I'm easily confused. Join the club. <laughs> Thank you, moderator. Moderator, at the uh, pre-assembly briefing from the assembly trustees uh, last week, uh, we were shown a, a very exciting video about the work of the Church Revitalisation Trust in the Church of England, showing young, enthusiastic people going to... Uh, what I assume were moribund congregations and planting new churches there. And my question is, um, are there any plans for the Church of Scotland to partner with the Church Revitalisation Trust or with other organisations, perhaps FORGE, in order to train church people in church planting? Thank you, Moderator. Thank you once again. That's a very helpful question to help inform the Assembly. Uh, the answer to that is, is yes, and uh, uh, over, just over a year ago now, it was what I used to, to allow uh, the Assembly trustees to grant the permission to release £25 million from reserves uh, to help us look towards planting new churches. We have, our team have been involved in conversations with the Church Revitalisation Trust. There is also a presbytery 
uh, had a recent conversation with them uh, to, to do just that. If you haven't seen uh, the, the video, then I would, I would commend you looking on the website to, to have a look at that, uh, which I hope was very hopeful. But please bear in mind, this is only one example of what can be done. There are many others, um, but I think that example is really quite exciting because it does involve young people, it's intergenerational, and it's a trajectory that we need to go while recognising that we still need to cater for everyone who supports our church currently. So thank you for your question, and the answer is yes. Thank you. I have one last question on the screen, and that is Douglas Robertson. So if you do have a question, could you please register um, now, or we will, after this question, move to the sections of deliverance. So Douglas Robertson. Microphone 84, moderator. Two questions, really. Number 40, Douglas Robertson. Given the financial challenges faced by the church, are the Assembly trustees able to reaffirm our commitment, indeed our priority to the church and people in areas of multiple deprivation? And my second question, can you also provide an assurance with the present drive to close buildings that, as the Church of Scotland, we are not pursuing managed decline, but are prepared to move in faith and trust by building new buildings, well-equipped spaces in the right places. Thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, many thanks for, for that very helpful question. I want to say yes and yes and yes again. Um, <laughs> I, I want to also highlight uh, the work of the, the priority areas. Um, the priority areas for many years uh, have pro provided a very, very good strategy on how to uh, do local mission. Uh, we can learn from that uh, in, throughout the entire church. So there is a priority to, to, to the poor and the marginalised and indeed the areas of our church. So um, I would also look to, to the work of the priority areas in, in particular um, to see how that is actually done and learn from the experiences. Yeah. They've been doing this a long time now, almost 20 years. Um, that's a, a huge investment in the church and we would do well to, to have a wee look at that. Thank you. Thank you. And a reminder to the Assembly that questions will always be in order, so I think we will take these, these last two, and then if we can, move on, and if you have a question during one of the sections, please feel free to ask it, because questions are always, always in order. Um, Robert Allen, and then Ian Aiken, and then I think we will move to the sections of deliverance. Thank you, moderator. Robert Allen, number 221. I thank the trustees for an open and honest report. Uh, the trustees talk of growth and development through new presbyteries and modernisation and simplification of governance structure. Are there plans to make presbyteries lean and fit for purpose, as the 2018 General Assembly called them to be? And if not, how can we achieve this aim? Thank you, Robert. I appreciate the questions because you need to get good answers, don't you? Um, the answer to that is yes. It has to be. Um, it also has to be yes because we want, through the, the, the new proposed Faith Action Programme leadership team, to facilitate that very thing in our presbyteries. We need to, as a church, stop looking to the national offices for the answers and solutions to our, govern our local governance issues and our mission initiatives. We will facilitate our presbyteries to be able to do that themselves for the purposes of mission and evangelism and new models of ministry and church plans, all of what I highlighted in my earlier speech. It's really important that we embrace this. If we are coming to larger presbyteries with huge geographies, we recognise that and do what we've always done, we will not be able to do what Robert has suggested. We must be leaner and we must be able to facilitate it and we make that commitment to help you to do that. 
Thank you. We've had another question come up, so I really will call a halt at the end of this one, and we can catch those later. But we've got Ian Aiken and then Peter Kershaw, and then we will move to the first section of deliverance, but you can ask your question at any point. So, Ian, I think you're online. Audrey, Ian Aiken, 376. Um, mine wasn't a question. I wanted to make a comment on the report as a whole rather than ask a question at this stage. We'll do that at section one, receive the report. Okay, so come thank straight you. back at us, Ian. That's great. Thank you. Peter Kershaw. <laughs> and the microphone number. <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> um, Peter Kershaw, 41. Moderator, my question refers to the section of the supplementary report on new worshipping communities. Um, it's a question and a half a comment or a half a question. The first one is, how sure are we that all these reported new worshipping communities are actually new worshipping communities and not just rebranded activities like Messy Church replacing holiday clubs, for instance. Um, I would like to be a bit clear about this because I think new worshipping communities are in many cases the future of the church. I just don't want to get over-optimistic about them. And the second question is, when looking at the viability of new worshipping communities, are lessons being learned from the Fresh Expressions program of the 1990s and 2000s, which had some spectacular successes and equally some failures? Um, so are these lessons being taken into account when assessing requests for funding? Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Again, many thanks for, for the question and for your time the other day when we sat in uh, Cafe Nero and shared our lunch together and walked up the road back here to the assembly hall. There is a context for measuring the new worshipping communities. That's clearly set out. The Faith Nurture Forum have made the inquiries of these new worshipping communities. And within that context, then the answer is, is yes. Um, the second half of the question. Yes, fr fresh expressions. We are in dialogue, um, members of our staff team are in dialogue with Fresh Expressions, Heart Edge, Church Revitalisation Church, Church of England, Methodist Church, United Reformed Church. They've made mistakes in going forward. Some are further ahead than we are in, this, in the, the, the church planting model and, and Fresh Expressions of, of, of church. And we can learn from any mistakes that they've made and take it forward ourselves. So yes, we're in that dialogue. We're all in this together, as we heard on Saturday from our ecumenical partners. So thank you for the question, and I hope that's assured you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we move to the first section, I've, I've noticed a trend. I've noticed a trend that the only female voice we've heard so far in this discussion with questions is mine. <laughs> and I'm lonely. So just a reminder that questions and comments and discussions are always welcome from everybody. We move to receive the report, section one. And I promised Ian Aiken we would come straight back to him, so we will. Ian, I believe you wanted to make a comment. Thank you. Thank you, moderator, again. Ian Aiken, uh, 376. Um, first of all, uh, thank the convener for his response to my question. Um, I, I would want to say, though, that um, whilst I'm glad uh, and, and encouraged by his own experience of uh, unions, um, we all have anecdotes uh, to share, um, and, uh, and and I understand that that the convener was simply trying to encourage us that that we can unions can be uh, uh, some uh, growth can come out of them, or at least maintenance even can can come out of them. But there are plenty of anecdotes and stories that I think we could all tell. Um, I have people uh, side, quite recently, someone sidling up to me at a funeral, say, telling me the pain that they'd gone through of their church union and what that meant to them. And, and we often get stories like that. And these are not because people are simply thrown to their buildings um, or are unwilling to um, make the effort to, to join in. Because um, often these people who tell these stories are, are folks who are faithful people 
um, and there's a lot of pain and 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 hurt around that. And so, uh, as well as the anecdotes, I suppose that's why my question was about evidence, um, not just anecdotes. Um, however, having responded to the computer response to my question, what I actually wanted to do was make a general comment on the report and indeed on all that we're going to be discussing, um, certainly in the first part of today, because it seems to me regrettable that we're discussing uh, both the Assembly Trustees report and the overture on the planning process before we've engaged with the Theological Forums report. It isn't so much that we need to do our theology first, although there's a very strong argument for that, but rather that in our decision making, our practice, we need to keep a dialogue going between our context, the, the trustees report, our experience, the overture, and our calling, who we are and who we're meant to be, which is what the theological report um, helps us to understand. And as I read the theological report, I think it raises some very serious questions about the way that we've been responding to the challenges that we're facing as a church. And indeed, I think it helps us to understand why many are feeling so disillusioned and pained by the outcomes of that response. I, I don't think it's just that it's hard. I, I wonder whether um, we've, at times at least, lost sight of, um, of the, the part about going to make disciples, that we're making disciples and the, the, the nature of the church as a community of faith, uh, of people who are um, by their very nature of meeting together around the Lord's table in the name of Jesus and the power of the Spirit are by their very nature, therefore, missional. Um, it, it's often concerned me that churches can be um, assessed on the basis of what they are achieving in their community, um, whereas, in fact, often it's their, just their very existence in a place. Um, which by the grace of God um, is, uh, is who they are and who they're, who they're meant to be. They need no other reason for existing. I, I just want to encourage us as we go through today to, to bear the Theological Forum's report in mind as we make these decisions and to consider uh, as we decide whether to pause and reflect or to keep going in the direction that we've gone on, that it may be hard because actually not because change is hard, but because we're coming from the wrong place um, and we're, we're not uh, honouring and, and holding on to the essential nature of, of who indeed we are. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, Ian. Now, we've, we've all, we're on section one of the report. We've got a question from We've got two things. We're going to keep moving because we could get stymied. So um, question from Moira Taylor, Taylor Wintersgill and then a comment from Justin Taylor and then we're going to move to section two. Mike number 53. Um, Great. Thank you, Moira. Moira Taylor Wintersgill uh, number 401. Um, I read the... It's a comment. <laughs> I read okay. the Theological Forum's report with great joy. Um, and I noted particularly the part that said um, that we have to abide in Christ before we do anything. Um, and it put me in mind of, a, of a, a, an experience in probation. I'm a newly qualified minister um, where I went to locum in a small church. I was told that the congregation were elderly and the church was dying. And my experience was quite the opposite. Yes, they were elderly. Yes, physically they weren't able to do very much. But when it came to helping me abide in Christ and sending me out with the Spirit, their faith was so alive. And I'm a member of the Pioneer Network. Um, I just want to warn, strongly warn against divisive language of pioneering traditional. You know, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it has to be an all-inclusive um, approach moving forward so that no part of our church feels like they're the dusty old bit in the corner. Um, and that's, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Moira. And Justin Taylor. 
Thank you. Uh, Justin Taylor, 492. Uh, I want to speak about a cultural issue because we have a lot of uh, culture, um, oh, strat strategy that's changing, but not a lot of culture. And we, all we know, we know that uh, in the famous line is um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, and the moderator has just alluded to this, is this report doesn't highlight a cultural issue. And I have w was going to put this in the deliverance, but because of uh, staff pressures, I don't want to. Uh, but the way we treat women in our church, I think, is quite sad. Um, and we have a lack of representation in all aspects. Uh, the way we, uh, for example, um, have set up the um, assembly trustees in 2018, we spoke about how we wanted an assembly trustees group that was representative of the breadth of the church, and we have three women and 10 men. We, our new faith action program has a male convener, a vice convener who's male, three men and one woman. The only group within that whole section that has more representation of women than men is the social justice, or uh, social justice in public life. Presbytery clerks at the moment sit at 14 men to seven women. Um, new ministers under the age of 31, I mean under the age of 40, 31 men, six women. We are not recruiting a breadth of our church. We are not having a voice in this church that is representative of women. And I think we are lacking. I think the voice of women is so important. We have over 450 years of this being a male-only association. The very structures of this church, the way we deal with business, is male-orientated. It's prejudiced and sexist. The other churches in our communities, ones that we said we want to listen to, the Anglican community, the Methodist Church of the UK, the Baptist Union of Great Britain, the PCUSA, the World Church of Re World Communion of Reformed Churches, the World Council of Churches, all have programs in place to include women. All of them. In our church, the first question I was asked when I was training to be a minister was, do you think women should be ministers? That was the first question. Nobody came to me and said, do you think men should be ministers? <laughs> we have a problem. And so I'm asking the assembly trustees to do something about it. If you're serious about this work, bring more females into the debate. If you're serious about this work, let the voice be heard. And if we are serious about inclusion, let it be heard. Otherwise, EDI, otherwise our racism report, otherwise anything we speak to is just lip service. And so I want to end with a... Um, a quote that is actually in our blue books, uh, or what used to be a blue book. Um, and it's from Rosie, a domestic abuse survivor, uh, in the Integrity Report. And I thought it resonates maybe to the whole cultural issue that we have as a church. And it says, I long for a church to be a supportive community, friendly, a community of courage, willed, willing to change the causes of violence, not a place to hide or cover up suffering in our midst but accepting our vulnerability, pain, and the messy realities of human life. A sacred space where it is safe, not, uh, safe to be just who you are and loved by God. A place of celebration, hospitality, and openness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We move to section two. Robert Fowley. Thirty-three. Oh, Robert Fowley, three eight zero. It was in response to the earlier answer by the chair regarding the six hundred posts being six hundred posts of Minister of Modern Sacrament, and I got a look because I. I expressed my feelings in the background I shouldn't have done, and I apologise for doing that. Um, 
I wasn't on the planning committee of our presbytery, but the message coming back that these are the allocation to our presbytery of 14 FTE posts were not all to be ministers of Word and Sacrament. We had to have a mix and we had to have MDSs and we had to do all of this. And therefore our plan was written in that way. And I am really confused because we have sucked ministry out. We have told ministers that that's not the future of the church. It feels that's what we've done. And I hear the chair saying the 600 is 600 ministers of Word and Sacrament. And I am bewildered. I'm not saying that, that ministers of Word and Sacrament are the answer, but the messages are confused. And I do not understand. And if the chair can give clarity on that, I would welcome it. Thank you. Thank you, of course. Thank you. I'm nervous. I said, Ministry of Word and Sacrament. I apologise for that. It includes MDS workers and other posts within that 600. My apologies for confusing the Assembly. It was just through nerves. Thank you. Julie Rinnick. Thank you, moderator. Um, uh, Reverend Julie Rennick, I am a woman. <laughs> um, my number is 239. I'm also a full-time presbytery clerk. This time last year, I thought I was going to retire from full-time ministry because um, I was tired from being in parish, uh, but I knew I still had something to give. And when the opportunity to apply to become a full-time clerk came along, it seemed to me to be a good fit. And I choose to do, to balance the work that I do by being pastoral to the ministers of my presbytery. I try, that's how I try. And I try also to make sure that we do things following good order. I am both encouraged and dismayed at the numbers because trying to make 600 spread across the whole country is a huge challenge and we all recognize that. But we're doing it. We're seeking volunteers where we can. We are working to try and fit for Fourth Valley and Clydesdale with 120 congregations and 96 charges. We have to get down to 59.5 ministries. We've been named in the Faith Nurture Report because we haven't got our plan together yet. It's going to be late, but it will be right. We are working together to find the best way forward because we believe that the church has a future and we believe it's really important. And so although we might look at that 600 and go, oh, but we need more, we need to also cut our cloth according to where we are. And when it comes to whether we've got enough men or enough women, I take the points that Justin is making, but he is a male voice with a male view and a male perception of what he thinks women are and what women want. And with the greatest of respect, that's mansplaining. <laughs> I'm also the convener of the nomination committee. And when I give my report on Thursday, we'll talk about gender. I will talk about achieving balance. But I challenge everybody here right now. You've come. Some of us come on a very regular basis. Some of us speak probably more than we should. However, we are the church. We are men and we are women and we are coming together. And you tell people that it's a good thing. You encourage those who are younger, who we don't see many of them, but we bring them and we encourage them. And if you want more women to be nominated to serve in the church, you have to ask them. You have to invite them and you need to encourage them. Because it was because my minister, 20-something years ago, said to me, Julie, have you ever thought? And from that very first children's talk he got me to do in around 1998, I'm here because somebody encouraged me. So go, be encouragers, and be encouraged by the good things in this report. But don't just listen to it. Respond and go out and do. 
Thank you. Thank you. We, we move to the vote for section two. And we move now to a new section three. And Doug Gay is the proposer. Doug. I'm going to sit for this. Moderator, um, that, that text is very small. <laughs> um, and also, I'm wondering if someone is going to read it or yes. whether. I agree, Doug. Yeah. I cannot read it. Um, so I'm actually going to... Oh, I can't read it. Anyway, here we go. <laughs> I'm going to have to sort that one. I'm blind as a bat. I wear contact lenses and glasses. So, <laughs> OK. I'm sure Jesus said something about the blind leading the blind. But anyway, right, we've got a new section three. So insert a new section three and renumber. Note that 600 plus 60 vacancies has been used as a base for planned ministry in 2024. But instruct the trustees to explore, A, a new approach to sustainable planning for ministry posts, which ensures local charges, single or linked, which meet a quota for ministry costs, presbytery dues, and national contributions retain a right to call a minister subject to the call being upheld by presbytery. B, a new approach to sustainable planning for ministry posts which ensures local charges single or linked which meet presbytery dues and national contributions but cannot meet a full quota for ministry costs retain the right to offer a call to ministry on a house for duty or appropriate fractional basis, subject to the call being upheld by presbytery. C, new solidarity mechanisms for augmenting the resources of local charges, which ensure that all priority charges meet the quota required to call a minister, that all charges not meeting quota can apply for augmentation to reach quota or fractions of a quota and instruct the trustees to continue to maintain focus on increasing vocations to stipendiary and non-stipendiary ministries as a strategic priority in the next five years. Well read. Thank you. <laughs> Dr Gay. Do I understand that the convener is willing to accept and support the, the section? Convener, are you willing to accept? To a degree, moderator. <laughs> I'd like to hear from Mr Gay first of all, but to a degree. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, you may get, you may gather there has been some, there have been some conversations uh, uh, before the bringing of this motion, and, and my understanding was that the trustees were willing to accept it, uh, but I'm very happy to speak to it, um, and um, I hope my time is starting now because uh, that took a long time to read. Moderator uh, Doug Gay, one seven seven. Like many of you, I'm wearing a gardener and gardener badge saying, all shall be well. And those words come not from Pollyanna, but from Juliana, Julian, Juliana, Julian of Norwich. Anyone who tries to move a substantial new section in General Assembly is wise to try and have a sense of the mood and the mind of the Church of Scotland. And we will know soon enough how people here feel about what I've moved. But here's my best guess. I think there are two moods currently across the Kirk. And the first mood, I think, is this. People are exhausted, burned out, and fed up with the mission planning process. The sisting feels unbearable. Probationers, including my former students, are in limbo. Churches with extended vacancies can't call. Ministers wanting or needing to move can't move. The process has been bruising and demoralizing, but we have waded through it. Folks on Pimpig have done heroic shifts. 
We've made tough compromises, and the end is finally in sight. Can we please just get it over the line already yesterday, if possible? And if that's your mood, I feel you. I really do. But I think there's also another mood in the church. Other people are feeling hugely frustrated and disempowered by the last two years. Many congregations are baffled by what is happening to them. They feel stripped of agency and control. They feel the process has been overly coercive. A central committee has given detailed opinions and even ultim ultimatums on local issues which they felt were not adequately understood. They warn us their communities will not forgive us for closing down their kirk, which they have been told is now B-listed. And many people who have been in touch with me feel that we are embarking on a course of massive self-harm as a denomination, which with the best of intentions will lock us further into a cycle of decline. And if that's you, I feel you. I really do. For those who may stand up and express their outrage that the section that I have proposed is in some way an attack on or betrayal of the poor and a capitulation to the rich, I'm going to anticipate that and disagree in advance. If that were the case, then by their very nature, a whole range of other Presbyterian churches across the world would be constitutionally incapable of just settlements, just because they have a more decentralized and devolved approach to sustainability. Same for all the Baptists and those dreaded Congregationalists we're fond of invoking. Politically, I am an unashamed lefty. I have ministered and worshipped in two of the UK's poorest areas. I live in a priority area now. I believe in high solidarity Presbyterianism. But I fear that what we're in danger of offering in the Kirk is high solidarity, high control, low empowerment, overly centralized Presbyterianism. The cuts are still coming to us all in some form, either way. But I fear that our current approach to rationing resources takes us down a road where we will find it much harder to regroup, to rebuild, and to regrow. What will give us a better chance of recovery is restoring agency and hope to local congregations, while finding new ways to live in solidarity with one another. If I did not believe that this kind of change, which, we're asking, which I'm asking uh, the trustees to explore, uh, and I softened the language of the deliverance uh, in, in, in response to them saying they were going to support it, if I did not believe this change would benefit the whole church, including its poorest congregations, I could not in conscience propose it. And if I did believe the current approach to mission planning was the best option for our poorest congregations, I would not oppose it. Our choice as a General Assembly, and all General Assemblies are important, but this one, I think, bears a huge responsibility. The choice we face is between two well-intentioned, painful options. There is no pain-free option, and we need to choose the one which gives us the best chance of recovery and renewal so that we can be a church of sustainability and solidarity, but one which restores local agency. Our current approach to rationing is a way to manage down numbers, but I'm not sure that it will help us to build up from the bottom. I recognize there's a lot of words in the motion. It's basically about seeking a new basis to sustainability in which the giving of the church um, will regulate the size of the church, but it will also mean that there is a new motivation and incentive that if you give and you bring resources or you combine to bring them, or if you gain resources from the church's solidarity mechanisms, you will have the right to call a minister. And we won't have the kind of, I think, coercive strategy that we've had to impose, that we all voted to do to ourselves, but I think has not been good for the peace and unity of the church and I think is not the best way forward for the mission and ministry of the church. I'm sorry that I brought such a substantial proposal late in the day. I assure you it was less to do with trying to be Machiavellian and much more to do with the fact that I've had a huge wrestle with my own conscience about whether late in the day to ask us whether there is another way we can approach this. And I thank the Assembly for this hearing. 
and uh, uh, look forward to you telling me how and why I might be wrong about this, which is very possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I did agree with, with, with Doug, uh, the change of wording this morning, but I wanted you as the Assembly to hear uh, what, what Doug had to say. He speaks so eloquently and has a, a real overview of where the, the church is, and I hope you have heard them. But I also hope you have heard the Assembly trustees and have taken cognizance of what is in our report. It is really, really important to continue the work that we're doing any pause or any stop would be detrimental to the work that's, that's continuing in time, trying to re reshape the, the, the church as it, as it is today. You needed to hear that today because this came out yesterday through social media. I only had a conversation with Doug at half past nine this morning about this to agree the wording. It's very, very important that we substantial pieces of work like this are brought timorously in order for you to make an informed decision. Yes, we agreed this morning to allow this to come into our sections of deliverance because all of what Doug asked for and has articulated in the past is part of the work going forward. The Faith Action Programme leadership team will help take that forward. Doug himself has been nominated to be on that team as are other um, people in the church who have tried to reform the Kirk in the past 20 years. They bring a strong voice to that table. So that process will continue. And I would ask you to trust me as a convener and our team to help that process through. I have acknowledged the pain and hurt on behalf of the National Church that this has caused our communities. We are in this position because we haven't done enough in 50 years. The committee in 1974, 73 started this process and got nowhere. We now are in the position because we haven't done enough. I welcomed what Doug has said. I hope you have heard us both, and I hope you'll take this in the context that it, it needs to be taken. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. I have Grant Barkley. Uh, Grant Barkley, 166. I'm not clear if I have any locus to speak at this point and whether the convener speaking closed the debate. I really hope not, because I'd like to say, if I may, moderator, um, just a wee bit in relation to timing. Um, and I'll just keep speaking if that's all right. Thank you. Um, so it's not to hold things up. So I mean, I've, I've, got, I've got views about what Doc, Dr. Gay said, and I'm largely supportive, but I really do, as a presbytery clerk, want to express something of the pain which many congregations are facing, not as a result of the plan, but as a result of the moratorium on ministry being called to charges until a plan is in place. This also gives me an opportunity to say that, albeit highly conditional, Glasgow now has um, an approved mission plan, one approved by the, the national committees. You've no idea how much relief that gives its clerk, but you've no idea how much pain is felt by the 40 charges which are currently unable to call a minister. They're not going to be able to do that very shortly because we've got a whole pile of adjustment to carry out before these adjusted charges will be able to call. If Dr. Gay's motion allows some movement, some engagement of people who I understand are already trained and are, are <coughs> desperate to get into charges now, that will be a jolly good thing. Glasgow Presbytery was able to place two of the people who had finished their probationary periods um, in, in not charge situations so that they could minister. These are exciting places. We've already seen not only adjustment but profession of faith from these wonderful new ministers who are unable to function fully by being called into their charges. So if Dr. Gay is offering us a way to move forward more swiftly, I think that would be wonderful. I also want to say how grateful I am to the convener for being gracious enough to hear this material so near the mark. I'm not seeking to score any points, but rather simply to say that if it is the will of the assembly that we allow those whom we have trained to minister, to minister in the short term fairly soon, rather than waiting for plans and adjustments before there are former, formal calls, I think that will be to the good of the whole church. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you for that. Now, before we've got one more person to speak, but actually the, the, tru the assembly trustees are in agreement with, with Dr. Gay and are happy to take this, happy to accept this. So I'd like to move to just asking, are the assembly happy to accept this? Okay. Thank you. So I think we'll, we'll move to the overture. And online. Oh, and online. Thank you for keeping me right. Thank you. Okay. So we move to section three. <coughs> it's the overture now. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Okay. We're going to move to, to the, the Glasgow, yes, the overture from Glasgow Presbytery. And I ask the Reverend Ma um, Mark Malcolm to speak to it. And Mark, if you could introduce the others who are with you representing. Uh, moderator uh, Mark Malcolm, uh, 189, and uh, Grant Barclay. Can't remember your number. 166. 166. Uh, and there are others. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak to the overture. Um, it's remarkable to think that moderator yourself and I trained as probationers at the same time and here you are as moderator and I'm wearing a tie um, <laughs> how things have changed I do come with a particular anxiety uh, coming from Glasgow Presbytery not just from Glasgow Presbytery but as a Glaswegian to Edinburgh uh, a number of years ago um, I don't know if people were aware that a lion had escaped from Edinburgh Zoo and was rampaging down uh, Princess Street when a tourist stepped out of one of the buses, wrestled it to the ground, and lives were saved, but unfortunately the lion passed away. Uh, the tourist quietly put his jacket back on and went back in the bus and left. And the, that evening the news read with the headline, Look, a tourist saves Princess Street Garden from being ravaged by a lion. Shortly afterwards, they discovered that the tourist was from Glasgow. And the headline news that night became Glasgow Thug Kills City Pet. <laughs> Moderator, I'm also grateful for Doug Gay's motion. It was just by chance that I missed my train this morning um, due to having to walk a puppy and uh, stepped into a later train and Doug uh, was on a train with him. And I'm grateful for him and for his motion because it makes me sound like a moderate uh, for the first time. Uh, in my life. The fact of the Assembly agreeing uh, Doug's motion actually, I think, paves the way for the motion brought from Glasgow Presbytery to allow it then to be enacted and then it allowed to be unfolded. There are three things that I want to say that Glasgow Presbytery's motion is not, three things, groups who it's for, and three reasons why it matters. The first thing is three things that Glasgow Presbytery's motion is not. It is not a criticism. And it is not a criticism of those who have worked hard, despite the pain out of which the overture comes. I think sometimes we find ourselves in those moments where we're standing at either side of a six and deciding whether it's a six or a nine and shouting at one another. It is not a criticism. And neither is it a call to stop anything. There have been good things that have happened over the past two years, born out of difficult circumstances, but many of these things were overdue and should have been done in previous years. Nothing is being stopped. Presbytery plans have a built-in review. So it makes perfect sense why the very thing that we're asked to do is reviewed itself. Neither is it saying, unlike Doug's overture, here is an answer. It's actually saying that Doug's plan B might also be accompanied by a plan C or a plan D. There are other options that we can consider and to look at. And the overture itself is not wasting anyone's time. It is just wasting the time of seven people who might go away and come back and say, well, here is something that can work. Here is something that takes us to a desti the same destination, but in a better way. So what harm is there in this overture whatsoever? In many ways, it is benign. In many ways, it is gentle because it's not prescriptive. It is just saying, let's have a voice and let's share it together. Who is the overture for? Well, there are three groups it's for. 
The first group is for the local congregation. When Jesus meets Peter in the beach, he says, take care of my sheep. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. And one of the great angst on a personal level that has been for me over the past number of years has been the neglect unintended of the local congregation, of the very people that were intended to care for, to minister to, to feed, to care. The second group is for the local elder. And suddenly elders have discovered that far more is going to be expected of you as trusteeship than you ever knew. New roles are suddenly being, and some might leap upon those opportunities, but others are actually deciding to step down. This wasn't the eldership that they were called to. And the last group is for those who are ministers who are being called to a changing call without any conversation. We're never called to be a mini-manager. We're called to minister of word and sacrament, to care for the sheep, to tend the lambs, to proclaim Christ. And not anecdotally, the reality is that the morale of the ministers of the Church of Scotland, despite some bright spots, is not amazing. And I'm a Dundee United fan, so I know about low morale. But I've got friends who are now off long-term sick. I've got colleagues who are retiring early. I've got friends who are going, I don't know what I'm called to anymore. And this gives space, as you said this morning, moderator, to breathe without stopping anything at the same time. There are three reasons why this overture matters. The first reason is this, is that we as a church are not what we once were. Where did we lose a million members? Where did we lose the tens of thousands in the past 10 years? We are not what we once were, and we are not what we could be. And I'm not entirely sure we know what we are or what our purpose is. The second reason it matters is that we need to get it right. Because moderator, when you look at the statistics, when you look at what the assembly trustees are telling us, this is our last chance. We don't have 10 years, moderator. We barely have a year. This is our last chance to get it right for the sake of the kingdom. Yeah. The last reason why it matters is that communities around Scotland matter and they need healthy gospel churches that introduce people to Jesus. As we were told this morning, we've got good news to tell about life and death and heaven and hell and new beginning. We've got a gospel to share. I'm going to save something to sum up if that's okay. But as a minister who has planted a church in his own congregation, I can tell, not in his own congregation, in his own parish, as one of the latest parish congregations in the Church of Scotland, Everything that I heard this morning and having gone through the experience tells you what is being planned will not do that. And left feeling as if we're being asked to make bricks without straw. Three reason things it's not. Three groups who it's for. Three reasons it matters. And having just agreed Doug Gay's motion, here's a perfect avenue to use it and to bring it to fruition. So thank you. Do we receive the overture? Chair, would you like to reply? Yeah. I've just received a point of order. Commissioners from Glasgow Presbytery who Commissioners who are from Glasgow Presbytery, yes, you can vote. Thank you. 
Okay, we have, I have four people on my list to speak. Julie Moody. I've got Julie Moody and then Aaron Stevens. Thank you. Julie Moody, 187, and a member of Glasgow Presbytery. Moderator, friends here in the building and those joining us from home, many of you will agree with the moderator's comment this morning about the power of music, and you will have seen the musical Oliver. The actor who played Fagin was Ron Moody, not a relative of mine as far as I know, but one from whom perhaps we could learn, not in his treatment of children, I hasten to add, but when he sings, I'm reviewing the situation. Doug's um, proposal that he brought and that the General uh, Assembly has just agreed asks us to explore something else. The overture calls each one of us to review, review the situation. Moderator, you have encouraged us to remember who we are. We are those whom God sees good. We are loved and we are called to serve. And many here in the building and those watching at home are ordained as leaders within Christ's church. Look around. These are the folks God has called. Remember who we are as we live between the celebrations of Ascension Day and Pentecost. Remember, we are the ones to whom Jesus has promised his spirit and through whom God is going to build his church. We are the ones commissioned to go and make disciples, the ones that Christ is using in 2023 to tell, teach, tend, transform and treasure. And we are the ones who've lived through the very real pain and disruption brought about by the decision of the General Assembly in 2021. Of course, the church needs radical action. No one is under any illusion that the model we were using before the Presbytery Mission Plan Act was instated was a broken system. Change was long overdue. I have known ministers of a previous generation apologize to me that they were too scared or too apathetic to make the changes when they should have. But we set sail on a course in May 2021 from that rather unassembled assembly with no real chart or compass, just trying to work out the best way forward. So this overture calls on all of us, two years on, to review. To review the decision that was made and whether it was the best and if, if it is right, if it brings hope and vitality and vision and energy, if it allows imagination if it frees us to focus on that decade of evangelism for which our former moderator called. If we are absolutely convinced that what we have in the 2021 Presbytery Mission Act is robust and that our local plans are robust, then they will stand up to the, the scrutiny of review. Yes, reviewing will delay things that may well happen anyway. It will unsettle those who have already made significant changes in line with the Act. So much hard work has already been done at a presbytery and local level, but reviewing is far better than realising too late that we were on perhaps the wrong course. Accepting the overture and the opportunity to bring review to a monumental decision might just allow for growth of the kingdom, dynamism, a reflection on what is happening in our congregations, in our communities, from Annie's land to Aberfeldy, to Apple Cross, review might reveal the changes that need to be made. So the overture asks those gathered here today in the building and at home with your stories of your congregation and your community to say review is always worthwhile and sometimes it saves lives. I was treated for breast cancer eight years ago. The cuts were brutal, literally. The regime that followed was harrowing. But I believed it would bring life and wholeness again, so I endured. Two years on, the cancer was back. The course that I was on, that direction, it wasn't working. Everything needed reviewed. Something else was surely possible. More cutting, more pain, more big questions, and yes, moments of absolute darkness, unimaginable darkness. Yet here I stand today, more medical reviewing may lie ahead, only God knows. 
But I'm so glad I wasn't stuck with the original plan because that plan would have killed me. That we've started so we'll finish is never a good approach. Let's review. I urge the Assembly to accept the overture. Thank you, moderator. Thank you, Julie. We've got... I want to check before. Um, Robert Hamilton, is this a point of order or a question? That's fine. Um, I'll, I'll call you in a minute, then. That's absolutely fine. Thank you. So we've got Aaron Stevens, and then we'll take Alexander Forsyth and Julie Rennick. And then we'll take you. Microphone 31. Okay. Stevens, uh, 501. Moderator, I, I understand that there is much pain and frustration associated with the current mission planning process. None of us have been immune to it. But I don't see anything in this overture which would res resolve that. I think it would, in fact, add to a waiting process. It could extend the process despite what, what we heard as it was being moved. Um, I think it can, in fact, promote a false hope that there's some better solution just waiting to spring from the table. It's true, as noted in the overture or in the background to it, that there is disillusionment, there is confusion, there is a low morale, and ministers are retiring even earlier. The, the, the cliff that we'd seen foretold is happening even faster. But it's disingenuous to claim that this is all because of the Presbytery mission planning process. To completely ignore, for example, that in recent years, we have had a global pandemic which resulted in lockdowns, which recorded, resulted in ministers near the end of their ministry having to shift gears entirely and result to technology that was new to them. The fact that congregations have literally been distanced from each other, members have been distanced, we have not recovered from that even if the pandemic is declared to be over. People were sick and some still are. People died, and we still mourn. So the pain that we feel is not all about the pandemic. The pain that we feel is also because there is a war in Europe once again. And to pretend as if the mood of a nation would not be affected by that, to, again, strikes me as somehow to willingly ignore the context that we're living in. Not to mention the climate crisis, which is indeed a crisis. The, all of these contribute to the malaise, the anxiety which is felt by so many members, including ministers. And, and the, tr looking for a new presbytery planning process will not make everything right again. It also seems to me that in the background, uh, the, we see notes about lamenting the trends that we've seen, the negative trends in giving, in people exploring ministry, in membership of churches and worship attendance. All of that is right. But again, it is not the fault of the mission planning process. All of those trends predate the mission plan process by decades. The mission planning process is a response to those trends. It might be an imperfect response, but in no way is it fair to say that it is the cause of them. We're we're being asked to appoint a commission to review things, and I would say that quite often today we hear about the need to be radical. To me, this particular response is not radical at all. It is repetitive. Once again, to appoint a commission in the hope that this commission is going to look at the exact same situation previous committees have looked at in previous general assemblies and somehow find an easier or better response. It reminds me of when I was learning Hungarian, and for a while I thought that if I found the perfect textbook, it would make the process easier. Over time, I gathered quite a collection, but no book made it easier. It was better to find a book that might be imperfect, but simply to bear down and start learning and practicing, making mistakes, but put the tool I had to use. That's what I think we need to do. Regarding the last section of the deliverance about referring more work to the Theological Forum and the Faith Nurture Forum, I would say if we are worried about ministers being spread too thin, 
Let's also watch out about spreading our forums too thinly as well. Please simply look at the deliverance of the Theological Forum Report. Virtually every concern expressed in this overture is being addressed by instructions to the Faith Nurture Forum and the Theological Forum. If we're wondering, if we're calling the forum to reflect on declines in church membership, I would point you to the last instruction of the Theological and Forum's report in which they're asked to prepare material for us on uh, the LGBTQ identities and community. If we get that work right, then we will be empowered to go about mission in a way that is desperately needed and we have not been equipped before. I believe this overture will present a distraction, and wherever it does have merit, the, the other deliverances in our, in our reports, and indeed the recent resolution by Doug Gay, resolve those issues. This would be unnecessary work and unhelpful. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Thank you. We are getting quite a few requests to speak, and I am of a mind to take the ones I mentioned and then test the mood of the assembly before we move forward. I would also want to say, um, I, had a, I had a friend who used to grade my, my sermons on, on the, the KISS model, keep it short, Sally. So if you can, be as concise as you can, then more people will have an opportunity to speak. So I'm calling now on, on Alexander Forsyth, and then Julie Rennick, and then finally Robert Hamilton, and then I'm going to assess the mood. Thanks. Moderator number 33. Oh, uh, thank you, moderator. The name's Forsyth, Sandy Forsyth, 007. <laughs> I can retire happy. My one ambition as a 10-year-old has now been fulfilled in this moment. <laughs> I'd like to speak in support of the overture and the premise that lies behind it, but also to ask a question, if I may, of those raising it for clarification. I think the premise that lies behind this overture has echoes with uh, the amendment that Doug Gay brought this morning. And the echo for me is that restructuring of itself is not missional. It's not missional theologically, theologically and it's not missional practically. <laughs> and the processes that we have embarked on um, take up a great deal of time and effort and involve pain. But of themselves, they do not lead to missional outcomes. Instead, what we need is a strategy or an idea of how they can be platforms, of how they can be springboards for mission, of how they can reintroduce the vision and the joy and the hope of the gospel. Because if we simply concentrate on the practicalities of restructuring, the missional element is going to disappear. And simply to call it missional, to use the five marks of mission in a way that could be accused of window dressing, is not enough. There needs to be more behind this to ensure that as we enter this crucial transitional phase, then we have missional outcomes ahead. If I could perhaps just briefly make a comment upon that, I say it's not missional theologically, because theologically mission is the mission of God, it's the Missio Dei. It's not um, the church of God that has a mission in the world, but the mission of God that has a church in the world. Mission comes first, and we are second. The church might be the only hmm. self-conscious agent of God's mission, but the church does not initiate mission. God is the initiator of mission through Jesus Christ. And so missional planning begins in the world and not in the church. And that's something we've maybe lost along the way in this process, that if we're to think truly missionally in terms of our planning, it is not about ultimately unions and linkages and reductions in numbers. It's not practically missional in what we're doing, because as we see in the Assembly Trustees report, around 5% of people are in active engagement with the church, be it in membership or be it through weddings or baptisms, etc. It's not practically missional either, because we're spending so much time and our energy in fulfilling the process that there isn't time and energy to act more missionally. So, I would support this um, overture because it might anticipate that second stage beyond this and to say what follows next, how can we empower and engage our presbyteries and our congregations in order to be missional after the pain of this process has been gone through? How do we aid them? How do we develop 
um, true missional thinking beyond simply quoting the five marks, a depth of theology and understanding, a depth of practicality that can lead to that second stage, that can make it a platform, a springboard towards the future. So the key, I think, is a transitional phase now, and this overture, along with Doug Gay's amendment, might offer us the opportunity to do that. So if I would support the motion, support the overture, but I might ask for a point of clarification from those bringing it. It envisages other possible approaches being identified, and I wonder if this may be behind my predecessor's comment. What does that lead to, ultimately? Is what the overture is envisaging, does it lead us to a place where we might provide in conjunction with the existing process, as I've suggested, a springboard and a, a leaping off point for mission? Or does it envisage that the whole process up to now, after these deliberations of other approaches, will be halted and recast from the beginning? And it would be helpful, certainly, for me to have that clarity about what the outcome of this is envisaged to be. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Julie. Thank you, moderator. Uh, Julie Rennick, 239. Um, I speak against the overture and really for one very simple reason. We are still deep in the middle of this process. We can pause to review or we can keep going. If we look at, let's appoint another <coughs> committee, let's have another review, we are still stopping the work that is going on. We are deep into this, right across the country. We are working to try and find a way through the Mission Plan Act, which is imperfect, to work out how we create a mission plan for our presbyteries, how we educate people to what does mission actually mean? Because when you speak to Kirk Sessions, sometimes it's very confusing. We are deep in this right now, and I feel that if we accept this overture today, in effect, we are pausing the work that we have already begun. We were only instructed to start this in 2021. The deadline was the end of last year, and as I've said already, there are presbyteries still working to work out what this means for them. When you pause, when you seek a review, people will go, oh, well, we better not carry on because we need to see what is going to be said, what are we going to do, are we, doing, is, are we now wasting our time? It causes confusion. We are not yet at the point where we can review the full impact of the Presbytery Mission Plan because we're still trying to work it out. This is not the right time. I understand where you're coming from, and I echo some of those feelings. I simply feel this is the wrong time to do a review, and I would not we wish to support the overture. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And finally, we will hear from, from Robert Hamilton. Fifty-three. Oh. <laughs> no working. Thank I know how it well. feels. Moderator Robbie Hamilton, um, two two eight. Thirty-nine years ago, I got a tap on the shoulder from my music teacher, um, asking if I would take on the role of Fagin in the school show Oliver. <laughs> I can still sing, reviewing the situation from beginning to end, but I won't give you that delight today, moderator. <laughs> We have to watch how we use analogies. Fagin, yes, starts by reviewing the situation, but every verse finishes with, I think I'd better think it out again. Yes, he was reviewing the situation, but he wasn't willing to grasp the nettle. He was reviewing the situation but wasn't willing to move on or to change. And at the end of the show, he sings a reprise of the song, and we'll never know whether he reviewed the situation or not. And what I want to say is that when we are reviewing the situation, whether it's with what Doug Gay brought to us today, whether it's with the overture, if it's accepted, 
then we have to really review the situation with an attitude that means that we have an expectation that something good will come out of it and that there will indeed be changed. An old uncle of mine who was my granny's brother was minister in Darville in Ayrshire for many years. And he said, Blessed are those who expect nothing, for they shall never be disappointed. <laughs> Blessed are those who expect nothing, for they shall never be disappointed. If we accept this overture, we need to be willing, willing to embrace what it means, to have the discussions. And not just to endure the pain, but to share each other's pain. Because whatever we accept, to use a theological phrase, whether it's an overture or an amendment, it means hee-haw, nothing, if the church as a whole does not properly and fully embrace it and have an open an honest conversation. We looked to the report at New Well Wind in Airdrie from the General Assembly of 2021 and 22. Hard reading, painful, difficult. Yet, that report that came from the trustees saw my office bearers having conversations they have never had before about mission. Because there was a willingness to talk, to share, to face the pain together. Because in 1995, two congregations in Airdrie intentionally came together to create a much stronger family of God. So let's expect amazing things if we're willing to embrace whatever the future holds, and embrace each other's pain, but also embrace each other's joy. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we move, we've got two things. We want to, for, ver for absolute clarity, make sure the Assembly is happy to have received the overture. Fine. Thank you. We also have an amendment in the name of Neil Glover. Neil. And online. Thank, thank you. Sorry, Th online. Thank you, moderator. Number 31, Neil Glover, 342. It's simply to add that uh, if the Assembly does decide to uh, create the special commission, then it should have explicit permission to talk with the general trustees because buildings are such an integral part of the mission planning process. Uh, the motion is, uh, the amendment is seconded, and I believe that the mover from Glasgow is also happy to accept. Thank okay. you, moderator. Thank you. We have a second? Yes. Yeah, Great. And Pre Mark, you're happy to accept. Is the Assembly happy to accept that amendment? Sorry, moderator. Would That's you right. like, would the Assembly would like just like to, to read, read out, out so everyone's yes. clear? Absolutely. So the amendment in the name of Neil Glover is amendment to section two of the overture as to the presbytery mission plan process, amend section two by adding the words general trustees after assembly trustees. Okay. Thank you. We're happy with that. Well done. Okay. I said I was going to assess the mood and online. I said we were going to assess the mood of the assembly. Does the assembly feel we do have other people who, who, have, who, have, who are there to speak? Um, but we have heard quite a bit, and it's been quite a balanced discussion. Are we ready to go to the vote, or would you rather hear more? Ready to go for the vote? Oh, absolutely. We'll hear a reply from the, from the chair first, and then... We... Of course you do. Yes, sorry, I Good just us. wanted to be clear before we, oh, before we moved on. Absolutely, so sum up and then the, no. David. Wait, 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 hang on two seconds. Let me get my brain going. David. 
Is there a point of order? We, we don't have it. Now you have it. We call lunch. Okay. I, I think then we, we were hoping to be able to get this business done, but if we have a new um, notice of motion, we're going to call for lunch. I think you've done it incredibly well. And we will see you back here at 2, at 2 o'clock.